not true. We, we are actually connecting learning e-portfolios. We recognize the value of learning e-portfolios. But our goal is to make a connection between those learning e-portfolios and how all that work can be used for career readiness upon graduation. This module that we're going to be discussing today, it's an implementation module, meaning that you can take it and go to your campus and follow it, and that will help you implement an e-portfolio program. And with some twists, depending on your main goal, it can still be used. So keep in mind that, yeah, it's based on research, but the main goal is that eventually you can use it in your campuses, and we are using it at UNCP. The article has been published in the International Journal of ePortfolio. This is the name of the article, the 6A ePortfolio module, Professionalizing Learning in Higher Education. And it's a very detailed how-to article. So once you read the article, you will know step-by-step step what you can do on campus to implement an ePortfolio program. And here is the star, the, the model, the things that we have been talking about today. And the 6A ePortfolio model, it's basically the steps that you follow to take that learning ePortfolio or start having a learning ePortfolio and eventually transforming that learning ePortfolio into a career ePortfolio and knowing how to showcase that in an interview. So you start with acceptance which is basically recognizing the value. And this was very important for us because at UNCP, our institution, and I'm sure the same thing is true at other institutions, ePortfolio was not part of the conversation. And many people, faculty and students, did not know what's an ePortfolio. So for us, it was really important to foster that acceptance. And I believe that when you want to sell something, it's really important that you convince people of the value of those things. So that's the first step, acceptance. The second step is assessment, and this is not to be confounded with assessment e-portfolios. What we mean by the assessment here is that you have to be intentional about assessing knowledge through e-portfolios. Sometimes we ask the students just to collect artifacts and showcase them, but there is no formal assessment. And the assessment component here was an invitation for faculty to take this opportunity and redesign their courses or build courses that are e-portfolio centered. After that, it's appraisal. Students stop for a moment and they learn what they have you know, done so far. They reflect on the learning. And at that moment, they start thinking about that job that they want to get. This is a good opportunity to see the requirements and the experiences that you need to get that dream job. And then what things you're missing, or what things you can do to document or to gain more experience to get that dream job. After that, when the students have mature and they have solid, robust learning e-portfolios, they engage in a moment of adaptation. What things need to change or what things need to be modified for that learning e-portfolio to be ready for career uh, hunting or jobs? And that's very important because a learning e-portfolio sometimes doesn't translate per se into a career application document or asset. And that's why we are intentional about that adaptation. And finally, once you have done and you have engaged through this whole process, how you go about the application, how you apply for a job, how you use an e-portfolio, how you interview with an e-portfolio and how you showcase it. All of those five elements are bound together and they are glued together by alliance. And in alliance, basically we are saying that this is a student center. We believe that the student has ownership and they have to go through that process on their own. But alliance means that we want to involve as many people as possible. It's not only about the students, but faculty, mentors, coaches, industry experts, alumni, members of that community. And all of them, they have active roles in different steps of this module. So let's get started with the, the model. We're gonna go through the model and we are gonna be telling you what we have done so far at UNCP or what we are going to do at UNCP because we have not covered yet all the A's. We have been doing this for a year. So in acceptance, it was basically what's an e-portfolio. As I told you, many people didn't know 
what was an e-portfolio. So we started selling about the values and the benefits. We built a website and we worked with our marketing department to build the name of our program. We didn't just wanted to call it, call it e-portfolio program. So they helped us develop the name, the e-portfolio initiative for career success epics. And we were in very, very events, uh, various events on campus. We were, every time there was orientation, we had a table at our university center. I went to the Starbucks, which was one of the busiest spot on campus, and there is a board there. And I was pinning things about Epics. I was handing flyers with my team. And basically we wanted to build that awareness. And sometimes it was just the name. Hey, you want to get your dream job? Hey, are you documenting learning? This is Epics, check the website, something catchy like that. And we spent time building the website and going to events and telling them why you needed to have an e-portfolio. We believe that students had to have that buy-in as well as faculty before going into the deeper components of the implementation. So we got the faculty buy-in. Of course, we're still working on that, but many faculty were on board Many faculty were at first hesitant, but once we started talking about the value, they started considering a, an e-portfolio. And in this stage, the alliance was basically with current users. I knew some other students who had used e-portfolios. E I myself have an e-portfolio. My team has an e-portfolio. So I make sure current users were part of the conversations and were helping us sell the the product e-portfolios our our platform was the canvas student e-portfolios which formerly was portfolio we wanted really to use that tool and also i started uh, making connections with industry uh, people who could be potential colleagues of these students and we had a showcase we had a showcase in which it was for beginners. It was a showcase for beginners. And believe it or not, showcases are great to increase your number of users and to start having the conversation and to make your e-portfolio program part of the conversation. I'm gonna be giving tomorrow a session about that showcase. So if you wanna know more about that and the whole process, please join. And we had experts, not only about the e-portfolio field, but I invited people from different industries. Uh, television, the head of a culinary art programs, artists, people in IT, in educational technology, in business, because we believe that when you are in that moment that you are going to get a job and you have to network, you have to sell your work to anyone, regardless of the field. So there are students in that showcase had the opportunity to network. That was really important. Sometimes students don't have an opportunity to network. Students became familiar with the tool, but the most important thing is the students help me develop success stories. If you want to be successful implementing e-portfolios, you need to have success stories as soon as possible. And it was really interesting because the other day I was giving a training about e-portfolio, and because I had a showcase, I showcased to these faculty members uh, the samples of work, the e-portfolios from these students. And I remember one of them saying, is that from our students? And I was like, yeah. And you could see that that automatically changed the, the perception about the content uh, that I was delivering for ePortfolios. So the acceptance is very important. Build those success stories. I'm a very ambitious person. And obviously I want to have a campus-wide implementation for ePortfolios. But given the situation with my budget and the lack of buy-in from every from everybody, it was not realistic. But I believe you have to start somewhere. And we had 10 finalists for the showcase. We have many, many applications, but we had 10 finalists who made it to the final round of ePortfolios. And that gave me already, that gave us 10 success stories. One of those students is working now because of the e-portfolio in my office. He's an intern now. Another one has been contacted by other people because they were judged by experts in the field. So the showcase opens a lot of doors for the students as well, but it makes your program visible. It makes it part of the conversation. It was a one day, it was an event for one day, couple hours. It was fully online. 
and we invited everyone on campus and we have a, a high level of attendance many people came and in that moment many faculty were like oh okay so this is what it's about the showcase provides specific concrete examples that you can use uh, to sell the value and to increase your program but also really helps the students understand because in preparation for the showcase they have to go through the process of that of building their own e-portfolios doing reflections and showcasing that to judges any questions about what we did for acceptance that the first steps and the showcase is not the only one thing that you can do we also had swag uh, you saw me being at events but do you have any questions about this step No? Okay, if you have anything, you can type it or you can interrupt me later uh, in the presentation. So the next step in the model is assessment. After you feel that you have done the selling in and people are already paying attention and they are curious and they want to do it and the students are talking about it, you want to go through assessment. When we talk about assessment, it doesn't mean, as I said before, that we are doing assessment e-portfolios for accreditation. That's not necessarily the goal. What we mean by assessment is that we want faculty members to use their courses to be our allies and use their courses to develop assessments that are e-portfolio center, to develop 21st century assessments that can be used in an e-portfolio. So this is an opportunity for course redesign. Many faculty members, they have tried for years to revamp their courses. Some of them want to promote 21st century skills like creativity, collaboration, critical thinking, communication, time management. And this is an opportunity. So the Office of Online Learning, we're helping them through consultations and coaching and training and departmental talks. We were helping how you can use your current course and change a couple of elements to make it fit an e-portfolio. We're very honest with faculty in assessment, and there are two realities. The first one is that not every course is suitable for an e-portfolio. That's a given. And the second one is that you cannot realistically revamp all of your assessments to make them fit an e-portfolio. And you need to be frank with faculty like that, because realistically, you cannot just change everything to make it fit into an e-portfolio. But even if it's one assessment, one component of the course that faculty can design to make it suitable for an e-portfolio, that's still big help, not only for your program, but also for the students. In this moment, a mentorship is really important for the students because many students, when they see that the assessments are changing, students need to be prepared on how to, okay, I'm not going to be doing the multiple choice, the true or false, the essay anymore. Now I have to do a digital story. Now I have to build an e-portfolio. Now I have to do this project. And you, when you want to implement the e-portfolio and your intention about the assessment, make sure you spend time training the faculty and offering the support to faculty, but also make sure that the students also get mentorship because many students don't know how to uh, produce certain artifacts with a high level of quality. So I think your department or whoever is leading the ePortfolio initiative, they should be intentional about providing time and resources for the students to succeed in these assessments as well. And here, your best allies, as I say, are the faculty member. This is where the faculty member can really help you take the work out and increase your e-portfolio program. And also your instructional designers, because they train the faculty, they help the faculty, but also they help the students in terms of succeeding in these e-portfolio center courses. Thank you, Mika. <clears throat> So the appraisal stage is a holistic evaluation of learning, a holistic reflection process, connection to career success, consultations and training, and alliance, again, with other groups. Uh, in our study, we found research that shows that appraisal helps students make strong career connections, and they build confidence because when they look back over their work, they see what it is they've succeeded at and the things that they have accomplished. So this is a really wonderful stage for the students when they can see and appraise themselves in such a positive light. 
It allows them to think holistically about all they've learned. It allows them to reflect, to see strengths and weaknesses, to see what they've learned and what they still wish to learn, how what it is they've learned has connected them to career goals and think about next steps for their professional careers. And in this step, students work with um, outside of their classes in partnership with academic and career services professionals through consultations, group trainings, and on-demand resources. So again, some elements of this model take place within courses and others like appraisal take place outside of courses that are fully supported by academic and student affairs personnel, such as career services. We also note that alliance with peers is vital because this stage can also, as much as it helps students see what they've accomplished, it can also create doubt, more questions about what they've accomplished. So we think this stage is important to work with peers who can support students as they go through this process, who let them know that it's okay to appraise yourself perhaps negatively in some areas, but to maintain a sense of the growth and accomplishment that you've already uh, undertaken. So again, an alliance with mental health, with student affairs, with career services, and appraisal is a key step. The next step is adaptation. Adaptation focuses on transformation, change, all again, in alliance. So in the adaptation stage, it's important to transition the e-portfolio that's a learning e-portfolio into a career or professional e-portfolio. Uh, I teach English, so I teach a lot about the writing process and the rhetorical situation. This is important to revise what's there in light of a new audience, an external audience, and to do so in a way that customizes the work toward the professional aspirations of the e-portfolio maker. So some of the changes that students might make at this time are formatting, moving from an academic or disciplinary style to a professional style. They may share different content or they may emphasize different content. They may use different technologies in order to convey what it is they've done. They may then conform professional appearance or guidelines or formats for professional professionalization. And they'll also make revision, again, in contact with um, industry leaders, with career services, again, making things work for the new rhetorical situation for this piece. So again, an alliance with career services professionals, e-portfolio makers can, can take a look at what they have and learn how to transition or to adapt or transform their work into a professional e-portfolio. And then actually working with prospective employers, they can see uh, the usefulness of their e-portfolio. They can see what it is those employers need or want to see, and then they can meet those needs through revision or editing of what it is they presented. Final stage is application. And we mean this in both the sense of the word of applying for jobs, as well as making good on what you have done as an e-portfolio maker. So this is part of job applications. They submit their e-portfolios as part of that work. And the research we cite in our study uh, shows very positive correlations between submitting e-portfolios and landing that desired job in the profession that students wish. It's a lot about showcasing what it is they've learned. They are now, in a way, putting, to, um, putting into practice what it is that they have done and done so well. It's an interview tool too. Uh, more than a resume, it helps a prospective employer see what the student can do, but it also helps the student prepare for that interview process. That student has reflected on what they've done. That's a wonderful way to prepare for interviews that will land students the jobs that they wish. So Alliance continues to be uh, important here. Again, peers who are applying for jobs can be of support as students use their e-portfolios and, and send them out. Career services professionals, again, continue to rely on the e-portfolio to help students think through um, how it is they pitch themselves and how it is they present themselves, how they submit that application or the e-portfolio as part of that application. Faculty mentors at this time might help students refine or further, um, further strengthen how it is that they see themselves and their strengths. So faculty mentors can help students put together what it is they've learned. Alumni and employers, sometimes our employers are alumni as well. It's a wonderful connection. Can help students then um, refine their, app their application materials if needed. But again, this is a wonderful uh, way for students to make those connections with alumni and employers. This is the way that our students moving from that learning e-portfolio to the career e-portfolio show that what they've learned and how what they've learned is relevant to the professions that they're entering. 
Great. So currently at UNCP, we are working with the first uh, three A's. Actually, Alliance, it's implicit in all of them. But as I said, acceptance, we started selling the value, talking about the marketing, why is it important? At that moment, the training and the presentations were more so about why you need to have one and the uses to apply to grad school, to get a consulting gig, to apply for a job. There are so many possibilities and we made sure we, we sell that message there. We had swag, we had a presence on social media, we had the name for the program and we were making sure we were part of the conversation to increase that awareness. Then the assessments, we started working with faculty. We were also partnering with a quality enhancement plan program that we have at UNCP. And in that, one of the components that faculty could use to demonstrate uh, the quality of the courses was the e-portfolio. And we have also gone to departments and we have trained faculty and done consultations for faculty. So they're more intentional about the assessments. Then appraisal, because we already had the showcase and that's why I really encourage people to have a showcase as soon as you can. Uh, the showcase really gave us an opportunity for the students to make it all the way to appraisal. They developed the, the, the e-portfolio for the showcase. They started thinking about career readiness. They started to network. And this is a moment to reflect on where they are in the learning process, where they are in their careers, and what things can happen with their e-portfolios and also with their learning to, to do better. So we are expecting, seeing this trend, that we are going to be heavily working and helping students more with the adaptation and application in the next academic year. This is a student center, and the rationale for student center is because every journey is going to be different. Some students are going to go through the process really slow. Others are going to go faster. If you start working with a senior now, obviously they have to go through the process faster. And uh, the good thing about the model is that it allows you to have an individual uh, journey. You have a sense of community, but you as the person going through the process, you can have a very personalized journey and it doesn't really affect the overall quality of your program. So again, as I said, our future steps are gonna be adaptation and application. We're going to be launching a community of practice. I did an e-portfolio community of practice in a previous institution. I'm planning to do the same here. It's fantastic. It's basically six weeks, six, six meetings. And I like to leave a meeting a week in the middle for them to read and catch up. So it's like 12 weeks or so. And you can provide food. You can provide the books. And many people say that the communities of practice should be totally informal and all of that. In some feedback that I have gathered, faculty members like to have an end goal. Once you see that you're meeting too informally, you might lose people. So what I encourage in the community of practice and what we're going to be doing is asking faculty members to think of a course that they want to teach using e-portfolios. So every week that we meet, every time that we meet, that we meet, you start with a really short, I will not even call it lecture. I will call it a very short informational session, just explaining some points, sharing some resources, and then the rest of the time that you're meeting with them. I meet with them for an hour and a half. I talk to them like for 10, 15 minutes just to give some guiding points. And then the rest of the time is for them to spend applying those guiding points into their course, being hands-on, interacting with each other and providing feedback to each other. Then at, at the end, they will have a course fully designed, e-portfolio center, and I encourage you to have a showcase for faculty because if faculty know that they're going to be showcasing those courses to other faculty members, they put more effort. And the, I, I think this is an excellent mechanism also for other faculty to see firsthand what it's like to have an e-portfolio design course. So that's uh, next for us, the community of practice. That includes a showcase. We're going to include also uh, continue doing the showcase for students. We had a wonderful experience. It's lots of work because it was online, so many moving parts, but totally worth it. Uh, we're going to continue building alliance, uh, involving more people. We're just getting the conversation with people externally and with members of the community. We haven't touched alumni yet, but we want to do that. 
I'm going to use those winners and those participants from the first showcase as possible mentors for the new generations. So that's happening as well. And we are going to be launching a badging credentialing program. And obviously there are strong connections with ePortfolios. We gave to the winners and finalists of the showcase their badge, but we want to make sure that those skills that are demonstrated in the ePortfolio are also connected to credentials. So besides having the whole ePortfolio, they have individual credentials for the work that they have done. So that's pretty much our next steps. And we want to leave the rest of the, the time for Q&A discussion, any clarification that you need or anything that you want to discuss. Thank you. And I'm gonna put up this slide in case you wanna ask anything about the model or anything that we cover today. Feel free to put those questions in the chat or to raise your hand. I see one hand is raised. So let's see, that looks like Kim. So my question is, um, you mentioned that you're thinking of um, having the winners of the showcase or the students who were showcased in uh, for their e-portfolios as peer mentors for the next group. Have you, uh, approach that with the students and what was their reaction to being asked if so? Yeah, great question. The students are honored when they win the, the e-portfolio. They feel like stars, which they are. So when they finally see, and this is exactly the reaction, when they saw that now they're considered a peer mentor because they started being just participants. So they really feel good when they know that they have what it takes now to help others. So that's, they take it very well. I myself give them a little stipend because, well, number one, I want to appreciate their time, but also because I want them to, to see the seriousness of this. It's like a little contract that we have and I give them a stipend. But given the feedback and the reaction, they will have even done it uh, for free. I think when you feel that now you're finally in a position, you went, you paid your dues, you went through the process and you can help others, Many people like that and they take advantage of the opportunity. I, I ask them to join a panel too, after the fact. And again, I give them a little stipend for that and, and they, they love that. They, they have seen that it has opened lots of doors. And I see that Scott's answering some of the questions in the chat, but it's helpful for those watching the recording if we vocalize. So if you want to repeat the question and, and say it out loud as well, that's good too. Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, there was a question about what incentives there are for faculty to take part. One of the things that we do here at the Teaching Learning Center is a syllabus transformation grant. It's a small $350 stipend that we can offer a faculty member to transform their syllabus. In this case, we would ask them to partner with the Office of Online Learning, so Miko and his team, and we would offer the faculty member $350, and we would send another $100 to the Office of Online Learning to support that, that transformation. So again, we're trying to help faculty sort of from the beginning to rethink their syllabi or their curriculum, to move through these stages for themselves, but then also to have ways that we can recognize and compensate them for what they do. Then there's another question from Sydney. Can you talk more about the last point on credentials and badging? Absolutely. So we were contacted by Credentials As You Go, which is a system level program. And basically they are promoting credentials, badger, badges. And what we wanted to do was basically recognize that yes, you have your e-portfolio, and in your ePortfolio, you have, you, you have documentation of many skills. The tool that we're using is Canvas ePortfolios, student ePortfolios. And when you click in specific skills, and I can show you if you have not seen it. Actually, I'm gonna try to do that now. So I can explain how the budget thing is going to work. That's an excellent question. So when you come here to portfolio, let's go to mine. The skills are here 
on the main landing page of your ePortfolio. And when you click there, it basically takes you to samples that the students or whoever has created. But when you apply for a job, sometimes you need the actual credential. So we are going to develop a badging program. So we generate, we create credentials specifically in public speaking, in project management, uh, and a couple of them. So this is an opportunity for you to work with faculty members, and we are going to be working with them to build learning pathways. So your course can grant their students a credential, a badge at the end. So it's basically similar to this, but you actually get the credential and you actually get the, not only the digital badge, but also the verification that you went through that. And the rationale behind it's because, yes, the ePortfolio is really important and all of that, but we recognize that credentials are becoming more important. Many people don't finish college. Some people have some education. And the purpose of the credential, the badge, is to recognize that knowledge. Some people never went to college, and they're just coming back now to college, but they work for a long time. So the ePortfolio can provide documentation of your experiences, but it will be nice to have the badge as well. Does that answer the question or a... Uh... Exactly, it's, it, that's a good point, it's, it's portable. So they will have access to, to export that, that badge. That, that will be the main difference, exactly, not just using portfolio. So we acquire, a, it's called now Canvas Credentials, and they will be able to export that badge uh, wherever they want. And that, that's exactly, uh, you just uh, hit it right there. The ePortfolio, it's too holistic. And the badge, sometimes I just want to demonstrate to the employer that I have experience with online learning. So all I need for this instance somewhere is that badge. So yeah, perfect. Another question in the chat from May. Aside from the partnership with faculty to implement ePortfolios, who are the other internal stakeholders that need to be on board to effectively implement ePortfolios? I yeah. could hop on there a little bit. Um, in our AACNU ePortfolio Institute team, Nico and I worked closely with our career services. So maybe career services could be thought of an internal stakeholder that's a, um, sort of the first group that needs to be at the table. Um, they've been vital in helping us sort of think about how to connect employers with prospective um, employees, our students. They've been helpful for thinking about co-programming and support. Uh, we've also come to realize that we need to connect with faculty or the leadership of schools and colleges that have professionalization requirements. So, for example, our School of Business has a passport requirement, which requires the students to demonstrate and take part in some professionalizing sessions. So for that, for the School of Business, the ePortfolio now can become the repository or the interface where those um, accomplishments are recorded and reflected on. So we serve that need for that school. For our School of Education or for other um, schools that have licensure requirements, the ePortfolio can segue in with some of the other work that they do, such as EdTPA. So it's very important to have sort of high level leadership in those schools, those colleges, where the ePortfolio can partner with or be a, a venue for that kind of demonstration of professional skills that are required in licensed professions. I would also say that something that I think is unique for UNCP is that we have uh, one of the highest numbers of um, student service hours of anyone in our UNC system, uh, given our student body size. We have hundreds of students uh, completing thousands of hours in service learning, community service, co-curricular service. Um, these are incredible opportunities for students to document learning, leadership, professional development. So we found that I think it's helpful for us to work with CCE our Office for Community and Civic Engagement, because our students are doing professional things in those co-curricular or extracurricular um, venues that we need to capture. Um, so I think that's very important. So from for that question, I would say it's important to have career services front and center, but also groups like your deans who are leading schools that have professionalizing requirements, and also your community service or civic engagement uh, offices because students are doing so much work there that can become part of their ePortfolio. In our institution, funding is not 
Uh, our, our institution sort of divides funding between our academic affairs and student affairs divisions. So what's unique about our work is that Miko and I are in academic affairs, so our budget comes from that. But the other offices that I talked about in terms of CCE or career services, their money comes through student affairs. So sort of funding lines, funding pools are different there, and that can sometimes be a challenge. We'll yeah, be, besides oh, giving grants, yeah, I, besides giving grants, I like to give stipends and motivation in any way to the students. So the showcase, uh, we provided cash awards to the winners, $600 for the first place, $300 for the second place, $200 for the third place. So um, when students participate as peer mentors or something, you know, you recognize, uh, you recognize them for that. When I invited the judges to the showcase, I pay the judges just to be judges of the showcase as well. So if you have, I mean, I'm sure they will do it for free as well, but it's nice to recognize people for the work. So if you have the funding, those are good ways of engaging people from outside and the students and giving them some recognition. See a question from David, and there's a follow up question from Sonia that's related. So I'll see if we can combine these. David says, I'm interested in the other side of the communication equation employers. My sense is that ePortfolios are still not a standard part of many job application processes. How do we know when and how ePortfolios are an asset in the job search and application process? And how do we help students tailor their professional ePortfolio? to their specific field of interest. And later on, Sonia asks about translating or transferring information from their portfolio to platforms like LinkedIn. So if you want to talk a little bit about that bridging to career and how the employers get engaged, please do so. There is a story that I'm going to share which connects to that. I mentor a student at a previous institution in engineering. He was one of the winners of a showcase that I did. And when he applied for the job, his dream job was with Adidas. And he submitted in the application materials the link for his e-portfolio. Many application websites, the portals, there is a space for website. That's where you put the link for your e-portfolio. And we teach students to put the e-portfolio link in the heading of the cover letter of the CV or resume. And when you are enclosing or finishing the cover letter, the last paragraph, can have something like, and you can find samples of my work here. So he went ahead and he submitted his e-portfolio with all the prototypes that he had developed. And he got the job. And he told me later on that one of the reasons he felt that he got the job was that when he came to the interview, because they saw the e-portfolio and all the things that he could develop, they already knew about him. So the interview was not about breaking the ice or just, just trivial questions, but they were really focused because they were curious about the specifics of his background. So even if the e-portfolio is not uh, mandatory, in my field, it's mandatory in online learning instructional design, but even if in your field is not mandatory, it gives you an edge and the trend continues. I have Hire, I have hired people, I hired an instructional designer last year, and in my mind, it was between two people, two candidates, and the e-portfolios, they were a deal breaker, because many people are good at talking, and they're good at interviewing, but it's the e-portfolio that really shows you what you're able to do, so I say, even if it's not asked, make sure you have a very strong e-portfolio, because that speaks volumes about you, more so than the things that you can say about yourself. So how do you know when, uh, again, I would say always, always. Uh, if they don't want to look at that, they will ignore the click. That, that's the thing. It's just a link that they optionally have to click or not. So if they are not into that, they will not click. But most of the times when they have it there, they will take a look. And how do we help students tailor uh, their EP to a specific field of interest? So one thing that I like now that I'm sharing my screen it's like, let's imagine that I'm applying here for a job in instructional design. But here I have training, I have public speaking, project management. If I click in instructional design, it filters to those artifacts just in instructional design. So this link at the top here will make you land just here. That's why I like this tool so much. 
So if I need to apply for a job in instructional design, yes, I can have a very complex e-portfolio, but it's divided by category. So I can use just this link right here. And I make sure my artifacts and my skills include the lingo of the job application or the trends in industry. And I make sure that my reflection here does the same. Another thing that you do to tailor is the reflections. Reflections for the job application have to be shorter. Those lengthy reflections are counterproductive when you are applying. It doesn't mean that you have to delete them. It doesn't mean that the reflection is not valuable. It just means that you have to, in a way, customize it. Many students don't like reflections, and I tell them, the best exercise for you to practice and be coached for a job interview is the reflection. When you reflect on the learning for everything that you develop, that you produce, it'll be very hard for people to get you off guard with questions. So yes, yeah, students sometimes don't like to write more, but if you tell them that that's a good preparation for the interview, uh, that that's key there. Uh, what are some specific ways a uh, professional business learn? Yeah, again, the reflection has to be shorter. You have to use lots of white space. I'm not, I don't like to promote the tool necessarily this one, but let's say that you wanna use just Google Sites or whatever. I'm gonna give you another example, lots of white space. That's the main thing. When you're applying for a job and you're talking about a career portfolio, it has to be lots of white space. And just when people land on the main page, put your name and the couple of things that you wanna be remembered for, no more. You can have an about section and all of that just with keywords, bullet points. If people are interested in reading more, then you give them a link. Okay, read my bio here. And then you can go into the reflection and other things. But other than that, make sure people land in keywords because those are the things that are going to remember you for. These hiring managers have only seconds to go through your things. I'm listing here my documents with really brief descriptions. So if you want to see my publications, you click here and it will take you there if you're interested. But if you want to see something else, then you click in the ones that you want to see. So those are some considerations and, and I'm happy to discuss more in detail uh, to talk about the differences. But please keep in mind that we don't want to say that learning portfolios are not important. No, they're a very strong foundation. You have to continue doing them the way they are. It's just that when you're ready to apply, some changes take place. But everything that happens with the learning portfolios are very valuable. I just want to add, too, to that question about employers. One of the things that motivated Miko and me in this work is that we are, UNCP is in a um, highly impoverished region, one of the poorest counties in North Carolina with high unemployment rates. We want to empower our students to be as ready for the professional career that they themselves want to make for themselves, rather than being sort of subject to what is there already or what they think is there or what might not be there. We want them to be able to imagine what it is they want to do and stay in this region where they want to live. So I think that question about um, the communication equation with employers, I think we're, we'll find too that the more we can do to help our employers see the value of an e-portfolio, we'll help the employers see all of the reflective, thoughtful, critical, searching, intellectual work that's gone into these, into the students' college careers. I think that will make them all the more employable for the kinds of careers that may exist now, but that may also not yet exist. So I think that that employer question is, is a great question. Absolutely. I see somebody mentioning co-curricular, very important point. During the showcase, we made sure that part of the rubric for the competition was that students had a combination of curricular and co-curricular. And we tell the students all the time, the things that happen outside the classroom community service, being in a fraternity, playing a sport, being in the marching band, those things teach you so many skills and things that sometimes not even in the classroom uh, you, you learn. And they're very important to get that job. But students sometimes don't have evidence of that. There is no documentation. So we promote in the ePortfolio program in EPICS the documentation and the relevance of co-curricular activities. Uh, for the for Kim who mentioned that. Yes, we work with students. You need to have a combination, linking and your e-portfolio. We use Canvas student e-portfolio, but we are not connected and just saying this is the only tool. 
you can the technology can change you can have google sites you can have weebly wix that technology is very secondary it's about how you build the e-portfolio how you reflect the elements that you need to have and of course how to showcase it during the interview my employers which forget the value okay i see that one was addressed thank you kevin for sharing uh, that sure well I, I just wanted to put it in there because we have reached the end of the session but i'd like to thank miko and scott for a really great presentation and an even more uh, exciting conversation i think we had some great topics raised by all the participants so thanks everyone for being active in the process